Well, first of all, let's start with this. Um, I'm going to throw some stuff at you that you should totally disagree with, and uh, you can go your own way uh, however you so choose. What I want to say up front to all y'all on here, ladies, uh, and if there's gents too, I want to say something maybe a little controversial first, which is, um, and I sometimes use the four letter word, I'm going to hope everybody's over 18, you know, my Catholic mom, I'm going to apologize to her, but I don't think it really effing matters if you're a woman or not, you have a vagina or you don't for you getting after it in business. What I do not want to get up here and do for you guys and gals is I don't want you to have a victim mentality. I think today right now is the best time ever to be a woman and a woman of color. And I think you should stand in that. Uh, in fact, you know, I worked at Goldman Sachs and I climbed the corporate ladder and did all of this stuff as a woman with the last name Sanchez that had no idea what it meant to invest. If you explained to me what ROI was, expense ratios, any of that jazz, I would have no idea. But actually, there's a benefit and a lot of benefits to being a lady and to looking a little different than everybody else, whatever that looks like for you. And so what I want to just sort of empower you all here is to like push that aside. When people tell you it's tough for us, we can't do it, fuck that noise. Let me tell you how much easier it is for me many times because I can't remember Chad, Brad, Matt, you know, Derry, Derek, whatever. They all look the same. They're all in their same suits. Sorry, you know, Blake's got one of those four or five letter names too, although he's got the accent, so that helps. Um, but there's a bunch of people that uh, that look alike in, in finance and investing, and we don't. We're actually a little bit of a minority. So I think you get to choose how you want to flip that narrative. And I just say, own the fact that uh, it's going to be better for you. And there are numbers that say it's harder for us to raise money, no doubt about it. There are numbers out there for us that say it's harder for us to get funding in lots of scenarios, no doubt about it. But like, that's not gonna be your story. We're not accepting that. So I just wanna categorically sort of like lay that down right here. And I think anybody who tells you that even if they're trying to help you, this is the problem. People tell you stuff like this because they're trying to help you. They're like, it's okay, it's hard, I feel for you. Sometimes we need to be told it's okay. But it doesn't actually help you because operating from a place of scarcity as opposed to abundance and operating from a place of us versus them helps nobody. The only thing that helps is the person who is stirring the pot, trying to get us to fight each other. Tell me how many people are gonna sell you a business when you go in with a narrative as being a woman, when more like 60 to 80%, depending on what type of business uh, they are, are owned by men, white men in the US, the businesses that we're gonna buy. Like, they don't care what your anatomy is. They want to know that you are going to take their legacy, the thing that they've built their entire life, and you're going to shepherd it. You're going to mother it through the next generation. And so I want you to kind of like, yeah, we're at a female summit. Great. Um, I typically do not do female summits. Why? Because I don't want to be divisive. I, I want humans. Don't care what your anatomy is. Um, all right. Soapbox officially off. Uh, hopefully there's still some people on here listening and I haven't pissed off too many people. Let's get into the nitty gritty of buying businesses overall. And there's a couple of things that I want you guys to do here for me um, is if you can drop in here for me and excuse me if you've already done this, how many of y'all own a business, have bought a business before, uh, run, you know, a contracting business, a side hustle or something, you can just say like, owner, you know, contractor, employee, just drop it in here for me in the chat. So I get a little love on where you guys are at. This is amazing. Look at all these owners. Holy crap. I have to admit, I wasn't expecting this. Okay. And how many of y'all uh, and all of you for the most part are now looking to buy, right? We got any sellers on here? Or is everybody looking to buy? All right. We got a lot of buyers on here. Okay. And how many of y'all have bought uh, an online business before or run an online business before? Anybody let me know. Run some. So we see some running, bought and run. Okay, cool. Now I got a bunch of stuff here that I'm going to talk about when it comes to buying businesses and give you guys some real tactics and processes. But because you're probably going to get talked at a lot today because you got killer speakers like the one before us who have a ton of information to share with you all, I want to try to play a little bit of a game with you, which is like, I call it crossing the barrier. So, you know, the, the key to buying the types of businesses I buy, which are 
boring businesses, laundromats, car washes, landscaping companies, is you got to cross the barrier. It's hard typically to get those businesses online and get all their information. Buying online businesses is actually awesome because you can API right into the back end and you can basically see everything that they have and they're they're pretty savvy. So a lot of it is listed online, right? Um, but crossing the barrier basically means that we need to engage as humans. And this is another thing that I think we're, we're losing as a society that's really important. And so I want to engage a little bit with you as a human. We're going to do this a little bit more as a workshop. And then Manuela, you got to yell at me because I'm terrible at times. So maybe you can just like throw up a middle finger. You can drop a smiley face, whatever you want to do so that at some point I know that I have like five minutes left. Um, the uh, Where I want you guys to start with is can you all drop for me? Uh, what is standing in your way right now? You're on here. You want to buy a business. Why haven't you done it? Uh, what is the thing that scares you? What is the thing that you need? Um, and let's deal with that issue today. All right, we got a lot of a lot of people talking about money. Oh, great, this one's so good. Uh, a lot of people, a few people talking about talent, like skill stack. Um, time is a real one. All right, I would say, and then a lot of people worried about valuations and recession. So let me let me say if I'm I'm saying this right. We're worried about money. Can I get enough of it to buy a business? We're run it, We're worried about, I think, um, I'm gonna just say something, I'm gonna kick one off the board, which is time's a cop out. If you're on this call today, you can do this. You just don't have a good enough process yet. And believe me, I get it. I don't, I think there are people in the world that are running three jobs that have a couple kids that have no time to even sleep. And maybe that's you. Nine times out of 10, uh, time cop out. That just means that you're not prioritizing correctly. Then you need to kick off a bunch of stuff that you shouldn't be doing. So I'm not going to focus on that one, but I am going to, and this is perfect. Like Camille said, time currently existing certain exiting certain projects to have more time. So she's starting to change the priorities to get her time online, but we're going to take time to the side. And if that's something that you're really serious about, I think getting time is just as easy as getting in shape. When people say that they want to get in shape, what do they do? They work out five days a week for an hour a day. They get a nutrition plan that they start to follow. They start eating more cleanly and like, that's it. So you basically need anywhere from five to seven hours a week to buy a business, in my opinion. You don't need more than that. If you want to do it over a six month period, if you want to accelerate it, you could add more hours, but it's not rocket science. Okay, that's that. Now we're going to talk about money. We're gonna talk about risks. I think that's really important coming into this right now. And we're going to talk about uh, talent or skill. How do we learn how to do those things? All right, so first, if you all, I'm, I'm old school a little bit. So I'd like you to have something in front of you that's a piece of paper like this. And instead of going PowerPoint crazy, I want you to start writing out a few things for me. This whole thing we're doing right now is nothing but mental masturbation if you don't take ideas from this and execute them. There's also something called recency bias, which basically means the things that are closest to you, you consider having top priority. And so you are here, you have already mentally bought into the fact that you're going to get some value out of it. The highest likelihood for you to execute and do something on a go forward basis is for you to do it right now. So what I want you to do is I want you to keep a list. If you have a, something like this on the left-hand side, you're going to have to-dos. All right, Cheryl said I should do this. Mark it down. Cody said I should do this. And if you agree with us, tell us to pound sand if you don't. You're going to write down, I want you to have some actionable to-dos, five, 10, and then you're going to rank prioritize at the end of this whole thing. Then on the, uh, let's see, well, this would be my right-hand side. You're going to write down uh, some questions that you have, questions that you have unanswered. Typically what we do is we write down notes of things that we learned. That's great too, but I like to write down questions. So it might be, some of your questions might be things like overarching question, how do I get money? And then you're just going to write these out because you're going to stack rank going through and getting an answer for them. So let's talk money first. So I have this thing um, called the Get Rich Tripod, which is just about the cheesiest name uh, anybody could ever come up with, but it has a purpose. So I'm going to share my screen and you can see into my psychosis with the amount of tabs I have open. Um, but this really technical graphic is what I want you guys to think about for the Get Rich Tripod. Um, anybody who says, I don't have the money right now to buy a business or you're concerned about money, that is a totally rational concern. 
I had the same thing. Um, but the truth of it is, is it's not a reasonable concern once you understand how money works. So I think about the tripod and this article is free. You can see it on contrarianthinking.co if you guys want to. Um, but I think about money as a tool, another technical, uh, another technical graphic. Money is a tool and the tool of money is like the seat of your tripod. And this is typically the goal of what people come out to, but there's three legs to get this leverage that is money. The first thing is people say, I want to do a deal. I want to do a deal. So I want to buy a website on Flippa for $100,000. I want to buy a laundromat for $100,000. I don't have money to do it, right? So how do I get, how do I get money? Everybody focuses on this leg. There are two other legs I want you to focus on, and then we can talk about some real financing sources. The second leg is time. Time means your sweat, sweat equity, your ability to pour into a deal. And the third leg is experience. Now, the highest lever leg is money, pure money. If you have 100K cash, you can close a deal quickly, a lot quicker than somebody who's going to ask for a seller financing or who is going to have to go raise capital. Money is the biggest lever in this instance. But if you are saying right now, I don't have money to close a deal, I want you to look at the two other legs. And what you're going to start thinking about is if I don't have money, do I have time? Think about it like this. Right now, I, Cody Sanchez, have tens and tens of millions of dollars that are on the sidelines waiting to be allocated to deals. AKA, I'm kind of looking at the market. I don't see anything I really like. But let's say that, let me look at some names on here. Let's say Fatima has some time. And this is perfect, Fatima, because Fatima has time, but not a lot of skills. I don't believe you don't have any skills, but let's say you don't have all the skills you need. Um, maybe. Fatima could go and ask me, what's your deal box, Cody? What kind of businesses do you look to buy? What kind of businesses do you look to invest in? And once Fatima understands what that deal box is, Fatima could get money for a deal very easily. One way would be, she'd say, Cody, if I bring you a deal, that's a $100,000 deal on Flippa that has $50,000 in free cash flow that fits into your contrarian thinking ecosystem because it's a finance website with newsletters attached to it. By the way, that is one of my deal boxes. Um, would you be willing to give me a finder's fee? for that. And I'd be like, Fatima, if you bring me a deal like that, of course. Like what kind of finder fee fees do you want? And typically it's anywhere from let's call it five to you could get aggressive and go to 15 to 20% of the deal. So you'd try to negotiate something. And right there, Fatima might make on a hundred thousand dollars deal, 10K. That's called deal sourcing fee. Um, those happen all over venture capital and they happen in all over private equity. The second thing Fatima could do, if she didn't have experience and she also didn't have money, was she could say, hey, uh, what if I go find uh, other operators for your businesses? So if I'm going to buy this fancy website, who's going to run it for me? Well, there's another way to source it. Now we call that a recruiter, but we typically don't think about it as another way to make money. And then the third leg of the stool is experience. And so on experience, let's say that for instance, um, I don't know, Vicky, let's say Vicky knows marketing. Let's say Camille knows how to do sales. Let's say Carla um, knows about graphic design. She doesn't know about business, but she knows about graphic design. Well, if I go on Flippa right now, let's say, which we could we could do this real time, and and I'm looking at some, I don't want you guys to see my deals on Flippa because I'm actually looking at a few of them right now and you might steal them out from underneath me. But let's say that there's a graphic design business on Flippa right now. And this graphic design business, yeah, here's a bunch. All right. Um, I love this site categorically. Like I don't do a lot of uh, stuff like this for people or partnerships, but I think it's really cool. So um, this is not the best way to uh, source this, but let's say I just put in graphic design at the top to sort of start sourcing or searching for deals. There's a bunch of businesses here. I mean, some of these aren't huge. Some of these are pretty big, um, but some of them might actually need uh, graphic design help. And so your experience in being a graphic designer to plug into my business may be exactly what I need. And that's a way you can get a business for, let's call it $0 too. Now, um, I want to take a step back. And what I want you to do is on the right-hand side, ask yourself a question. What do I have? Money, time, or experience? 
The answer is not none of those things. Every single person here has some aspect. So I want you to write how much money you have that you'd want to invest in something. I want you to write how much time you'd be willing to allocate to a deal or running a company. And then I want you to write how much experience you have or what your experience is. AKA Blake understands websites. He understands obviously buying online businesses. Cody understands laundromats. Write those out. And what you're going to start doing after this is for those of you that don't have money, you're going to start searching for people that can help you with money. Now, the second thing, if we don't have money, is, uh, let's see, SBA banks. Um, most used. All right. So then there's a bunch of ways that we can... Um, there's a bunch of ways that we can buy businesses with other people's money. Now, buying online businesses sometimes are sketchy for this thing called the SBA um, 7A program, which is typically where you buy businesses using the government's money. But one thing that's cool uh, that I like to do is if I'm thinking about how to get other people's money, I want to just go talk to a bunch of people that give money to people frequently. So the first thing I think you should do if you want to buy boring businesses like you do in my world, when we're talking at our mastermind and courses about buying hard asset businesses, we basically say one of the first things I want you to do is I want you to reach out to like two or three of the top SBA lenders in the 7A program. These are people that give money from the US government to people who buy businesses like you and me. And I want you to just sit down with them. Hey, I don't have a business yet I'm gonna buy. I'm interested in buying a business. Who at your firm can I speak to that's in my region that helps people buy businesses? This is where you're gonna talk about your money amount below $100 million in purchase price or below $50,000 in purchase price. I wanna just understand the process. I'm going to execute on it in the next six to 12 months. The second thing that you could do is you could go to your local SBA. Now your local SBA is amazing because in your local SBA offices, these are government officials that their literal job is only to help you figure out how to get money from governments and from uh, their grant programs. So you could look at, you know, let's see, do I live in a regional office site where I can actually see ugh, government websites? Um, so let's say that I live in, uh, you guys know where I live. I hope there's no stalkers on here. Okay. The closest regional office is, uh, let's see, we got Dallas and we got San Antonio. So I could go to either of those locations or I could call them up and say, I'm located in your regional location. Can you help me? You can also go to district offices. So this would be like in Arizona overall, usually they're in the capital. It's interesting to me, there's not one in, in Austin, but you would reach out to these and try to get them to help you get financing. Okay, so I wanna take a pause there. Um, that is how we use other people's money. The only other thing that I would add to this list that we haven't talked about is raising capital. We are in, I believe, a recession right now already with uh, inflation at almost all time highs, at least within our lifetime. Uh, I, I think the recession will get worse. I think inflation will get worse. What do you guys do when there's a reflection, reflect, uh, recession and inflation? How do you protect against that? Does anybody know the answer? You could drop it in there. How would you protect your money and your net worth versus those two? Histor definitely assets. Historically, you might say real estate, right? Well, the problem with real estate is interest rates are incredibly high right now, right? The market is incredibly crowded and we're still at all time high levels. One of the best ways to protect in this environment is to buy low CapEx businesses, so businesses that don't have a lot of costs uh, overall, and businesses that have cash flow with the ability to increase prices. So I have a model that I call BRRT. And it basically talks about how to buy online businesses, or I'm sorry, how to buy any businesses. We could apply to online businesses too. And maybe somebody can drop this for me in the thing as well. You can just Google like BRRT, contrarian thinking. So if we think uh, that the market is going to get worse, there's something that I like to talk about. Oops, this is not the right one. Uh, here we go. Okay. We use this thing at contrarian thinking called the BRRT market. And basically the BRRT method, what it does is we talk about buying businesses that cash flow 
in recession resistant asset classes. So we don't want to go out and buy a NFT marketplace. That's probably not going to do great right now. Uh, with the ability to raise prices and then add technology. So think about these online businesses. A lot of times people buy online businesses in a silo. I actually like to buy online businesses as supplements to my hard asset businesses, things like car washes, laundromats, et cetera, because I wanna add the technology. I wanna add the SEO. I wanna add the backlinks. I wanna add the social media from these online businesses to one of my IRL businesses. But this methodology for you is a way for you to go out and buy assets that have the ability to raise prices in recession resistant sectors. And you can use the fact that I'm guessing most of you here are pretty tech savvy given the fact that you're on this uh, call today. Now, one thing that I want you guys to be careful of. So when you do this BRRT method, there's a couple things I don't want you doing for the first deal that you're buying. I don't want you buying unprofitable distressed businesses. There are something like 12 million businesses for sale right now in the US. I don't know, Blake and crew probably know the number of online businesses for sale. These are just like brick and mortar businesses that I'm talking about. Um, but there are so many of them that most of these businesses will, nev will never sell. So the biggest mistake I see people make when they buy businesses for the first time is they buy too small of a business because they're scared and they don't realize that if they went up a little bigger in size, they'd actually have more cushion. So they buy too small small of a business and they buy a business that typically, um, you know, they, they, they think a lot, they fewer future think. So I call pricing your value into the deal. We do not want to do this. You want to buy a business that does $100,000 in revenue and $50,000 in profit. And you want to buy this business that does $50,000 in profit on average, in my opinion, for three to maybe seven or eight X profit because I doubt many of you on here are buying businesses that are, doing, that are bigger than a million dollars. So three to eight X profit is where we kind of wanna play. And we buy a business based on what it is doing today. We do not buy a business based on what, you know, Vicky or Valora can do to the business. That goes into your secondary model, what's called your future projections. And for all you business owners, you already know about this. You say in your business, or I hope you already have in your business right now, hey, next quarter, I think we're gonna do 15% more than what we do now. I think we'll have to have this extra headcount. And so here's what the profit will be on the two. So I do not want you to buy the ugliest house on the block and renovate it because what happens every time you do a renovation? Do what renovations ever uh, come through early and under budget. Are you ever like, ah, oh, my contractor showed up early. Everything was cheaper than I thought. It got done immediately. Never happens. The same thing will happen when you buy a business. The, the seller typically will tell you, oh my God, there's so much opportunity in this business. It's incredible. There's so much left on the bone here. It's just, I'm really tired. I have to retire. I have this better opportunity. No, 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 no. I buy your business based on what it does today, not from a future perspective, especially as we're coming into this recession. So that's the first thing. This BRRT method should be very straightforward for y'all. And you can apply this to any type of business. Think about this. Y'all remember the Costco hot dogs? They're like, what were they? $1.50, $1.25, something like that. And that Costco hot dog had never been increased in price for like 30 years. That's how most small businesses are. They do not do price increases. And they do, there you go. <laughs> Opal knows, 150 with a soda. So they do not do price increases. They do not do value add practice. Uh, practices. They do not do subscription models where you add reoccurring revenue, which means you can sell the business for more to them. Even in, I get amazed, some of the businesses that I see on Flippo with the traffic that they have to these online businesses, but they don't do email collection. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, all these people are coming, they're saying hi, and you're not grabbing any part of them. So you can say hi again to them at a future date. It's a huge value add. So use this BRRT message. Uh, method and you can figure out which businesses can you raise their prices um, in recession resistant sectors and add technology. Now this goes into your future model. It's very easy, the historical model on why we buy. Now, one other thing I wanna show you is what I call sows. So um, contrarian thinking, we talk about um, how to buy cash flowing businesses in a lot of different ways, but we also talk about just financial freedom overall. A lot of people, Danica, thank you with the five minutes until Q&A. A lot of people, um, am I sharing my screen anymore? I'm not, hold, hold please. 
All right. Um, I do like this graphic. I don't know if Blake always agrees with me or the team, but I think sometimes the sexier industry that you're in, the less money you earn on average. Um, and so I actually like to buy businesses that I call boring businesses, kind of tongue in cheek, and that they're not that sexy. And one of the ways that I buy boring businesses is using this framework that y'all can see right here. This is called SALS. And um, I basically looked at my portfolio and I said, how do I know that I want to buy a business? Because I think this is a lot of your problem. It's how do I find the right deals? But your problem is not actually finding deals. It's that you don't know what a good deal looks like for you. You haven't defined your deal box. The second that you define your deal box, everything gets easier. It's sort of like, you know how they say riches are in niches? Or, um, you know, if, if you're an investor like me, if you want people to give you deals, if I just say, hey, I'm an investor in stuff, that's just too hard for people to think about. They're not going to, have to think about you for every deal. But if you say, hey, I buy stale businesses, what does stale mean? It means there's not a lot of innovation in these businesses. Think landscaping companies that have been around forever, roofing companies, uh, you know, um, cleaning companies. And these businesses are old. So I don't buy a new startup. I buy a business that's been around for like five or 10 or 20 years that like, you know, maybe is run by a 65 year old. I buy businesses that have weak competition. What does that mean? If they talk to me about patents or, you know, um, their proprietary technology um, and their ability to, to corner a market, I'm probably out. I'm looking for the guy who like, how many of you guys have ever had a handyman come by and be like, wow, service exceptional. Follow up to ask for testimonials and reviews, unparalleled, you know, um, I, now he has me on his email list and I follow him on TikTok. Like it doesn't happen, right? These are, these are weak competitors. And then, and then lastly, I look for simple companies. So biotechnology, I'm out. No, thanks. I'm not smart enough to understand that. Um, let's see what else. Uh, new AI startup. That's great. I might give them some venture money, but no, that's not the company that I'm going to buy. And so there's actually real power in having your deal box very specific. And in the, the course that we have on business buying, we talk about deal clarity and getting it on 10 different levels from geography to how much money you want to make to how much money you want to put in to sort of the risk you want to take to your debt to loan ratio. We get really specific on what we want because just like in any other industry uh, or in any other thing we do, when you're specific, you know, woo woo moment of the day, the universe kind of answers. When you're like, yeah, I think I want to be an astronaut, but I also might want to write a book, but I also might want to open a business. The world gets confused. There's too much optionality today. And so we need to narrow down our, uh, we need to narrow down our scope handedly. All right. I actually want to, maybe the last thing I'll leave you with, with is this. I think you're crazy if you aren't getting ready to buy in this market. I think you're crazy. I mean, it's good for me, less competition. I'll take all the monies, but I think you're crazy. And, you know, I always thought one of my bosses said, Cody, and this is a Goldman, so no surprise. Uh, we get rich quietly here, get rich quietly. And, and I thought, you know, that's not that interesting to me. I think it'd be a lot better and our world would be an entirely better place. If more of you, if more of all of us were owners, like it seems like we already have. And if, and if we could transition the next, you know, the, the prior generation's businesses into our hands, I would like to see more, you know, I would like to see Chelsea cupcakes instead of sprinkles. I would like to see Cody's coffee company instead of Starbucks. I want more of these small businesses in our life. And so I think you not only will make a lot of money and be able to protect yourself during a recession with these types of businesses, but you have a moral prerogative as capable humans to take this generation of small businesses and continue them. And so I think right now you need to be doing everything possible to get your money in order. So how can you raise capital if you need to? How could you get debt lined up if you need to? How could you get your time and experience lined up if you need to, to then to simultaneously make sure you understand how to buy, take all the information that Flippa gives you for free and use it, join my newsletter, join our courses, whatever the case may be, so that when a good deal comes across your path, you know what it looks like. The biggest problem for most people is, and I'll use this as an example, Deals are very varied, right? Just like flowers. You got sunflowers here, you got snapdragons, you got daisies. I don't know what this one's called. 
what if this is what a good deal looks like? The problem is most of us say, well, this is a flower. These are flowers, these are deals, but I don't know a good one versus a bad one. And I don't know what a good one versus a bad one is for me. And so if you are not incredibly tight on your deal box, I would spend a ton of time on that because when you have good deals, it's actually not very hard to get capital and to get talent, but it's that you probably don't have the understanding of what a great deal looks like yet. All right. Um, and okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, Valora, can I pick on you a little bit? I don't know you. I bet you're amazing. Um, she says, I was offered a good deal. I just couldn't afford it. Story of my life. One, not your life, not your life. Remember, this is not our story. The second that we put shit out like that in the universe, who on here is now going to say, I want to give Valora money because she says the story of her life is she never has money for anything. Is that a power position? No, a power position is you are right. I got a good deal once. And I didn't know how to get capital for it. But now I know how to get capital for it. And so that will never happen to me again. Because when I get on a call like this with Flippa, you know what I'd be doing in the chat, you guys? And good for you that you haven't done this in some regard. But I'd be saying, you know what I'm looking for right now? I'm looking, for, I have 100K to allocate to deals. I'm looking for this type of deal right now. If anybody ha it has the time or experience lever, I'd like to work with you. And I would be telling everybody everywhere what exactly you want. So um, we're gonna go to Q&A right now, but Valora, that's not your story. I don't buy it. And you just didn't have the knowledge on how to get money. Your problem is not that you don't have money, it's that you don't have knowledge. Let's slip that around. What's going on, Blake? Hey, how are you? Thank you, so that, was that was unbelievable. Oh, I'm so glad, good to see you, man. So good to see all this chat too. So let's start with this, right? Because you talked about deal box um, and that makes a lot of sense to me, figure out what you want, but let's tap into the skills that might help out on the deal box too, because one of the questions is, how do we know what a good deal is for us? And then the other thing I've got here is that um, I know nothing about business. So there are two comments from the community. I know nothing about business. And then how do I know what a good deal is for us? And I reckon a good deal is what your best skill is. What's your perspective? Yeah. Well, let's take the easy one first. I know nothing about business. Go find three to five people that know something about business. Go find three to five people who have kind of what you want in business. Don't be a taker. Don't ask them to be your mentor because that's annoying. Nobody has time for more mentees. Ask them instead really specific questions and try to add value to them. And say, I know nothing about business, but I'm going to stay up later to do two hours a week for you of work or two hours a day of you uh, for you of work. And I'm going to learn from you. And then hopefully I could get you deals or I could get you investments. If you don't know about business, just go find your three to five. That's it. And just try to take as much information from them and from free things like this as you can. That's your goal. As far as your deal box, it really starts with self-reflection. So I think the first thing is the tactical things. How much money do you have to invest or buy a business? How much money does a business need to give you in order for it to be useful? AK, if Blake or I get a deal that comes across us, that's a $30,000 deal for us to buy, and it gives us $10,000 in profit, that's probably not interesting enough for us at this point. Um, you know, my deal box is, I probably now, I mean, and this is like, fuck, wild, young Cody would be like, get out of town. I probably need to have a couple hundred thousand dollars in free cash flow to me for a deal to be good for me, right? And Blake's probably similar because Blake's running a really big business. So you need to get how much money you got, how much money you need. I think those are the first two things. And then you take time. How much time do you want to allocate to it? And how much time do you got? And you kind of do the same thing. And then the third leg, I think actually this fits right in my tripod, is experience. Like if Blake gets a biotech deal, he's probably passing, even if it has $500,000 in free cash flow and he could buy it for $800,000. Like he doesn't know what to do with that business. I don't know what to do with that business. Maybe we could find somebody else, but it's a lot of lift for our non core skill set. So for your first couple of deals, I actually like people to stay kind of in their lane, um, yeah. which is buy a landscaping company, but because you realize it's really a marketing company and you're good at marketing. So does that help, Blake? Do you think that answers the question enough as we can in three seconds? Yeah, I think it does. I, I mean, I, there's a couple of things I'd add, which is that, um, you know, most businesses are actually just built on somebody else's skill already, right? So if someone's actually running a really good quality crochet blog, 
it's not because they know a lot about business. It's because they probably know a lot about crochet. So you can actually go where your skill set is and apply that skill set to any one of the businesses you find within your deal box. So don't be afraid to apply your skill. It doesn't have, you don't have to have business expertise. What you have to have is some skill or some passion to apply. Um, one of the greatest points you made is um, a point about not buying a distressed or, or underperforming asset. And sometimes it can look good because it's cheap, right? And so I've made the point here, you know, don't get caught up in something that is cheap. And I've said turnarounds are hard, right? If something's declining by 10%, for the last three months, then it's probably going to decline by 10% the next three months. And then you went on to say, well, you should expect to pay three to eight times profit. Um, that can sometimes look a bit scary to people. Um, how do you sort of rationalize a something sort of that's six to eight times profit and the fact that that might mean six to eight years before I get a return on investment? Yeah, it's a really good question. So I think there's a couple things there. Really depends on the type of business. So, and, and what your risk level is. This is the tough part about buying businesses. It'd be so easy for me to tell you how to do a real estate deal because there's like not that many variables. In this one, if you're buying a business that does $10,000 in free cash flow to you, let's say, and you're buying it for 60 or 80K, but the purchase price is really low, and you realize, oh my gosh, they've got an email list and all this upside. And it's a competitive deal in which the market price says that this deal, this is a fair price for this deal. Then I would feel comfortable. So I guess it's not that different than real estate in some ways. It's like, what are your comps? Like, what is this actually worth to the market? And then simultaneously, it's can I afford for this to go sideways in some way, or can I afford to buy this deal out entirely? And then the third aspect is for this business. Do I see not just Cody level talent? I mean, whatever, let's use Blake instead, but like Blake's a genius at online businesses. He shouldn't apply a 15 X multiple to buy in a business just because he could take, I don't know, you know, uh, milkjugs.com and make it make 15 X more money with his skill set. He should say, no, the market is this. And there's a lot of opportunity and meat on this phone. And so it's reasonably priced. And this is where the this, the art comes in. The only last thing I'll say about this is um, you need to get around other people that are doing deals. It makes it so much easier. Like the second, it's part of the reason why selfishly I have my mastermind is because half the time I'm like, I gotta, I wanna buy this or I'll bother you, you know? I wanna buy this newsletter business. They say they have this email list of 500,000, you know, but there's like a couple of things I don't understand about how they accumulated them. You know, when I hadn't acquired a lot of newsletters, I would use other people in my ecosystem. And so, find other people that have done a deal. Last thing I'll say is it's really easy, actually. You know, we deal junkies are kind of easy. I'm, I may be harder because I'm public on the internet, but there's a bunch of people on Twitter that buy only plumbing companies. How many buddies do you think Brad that buys only buddy, plumbing companies has that wants to talk about his plumbing company acquisition? 0, 0.0. So you could be that person that he could help. Yeah, super key. There are so many communities. Your newsletter is a really good one. So everyone should subscribe to that. Um, for those of you who are interested, there are some things uh, some things on the Flipper blog about uh, buying your first business. So that the tips around how to create a checklist, a short list, how to find your first deal. So go and check out those resources. As Cody said, they're all over Twitter. They're on LinkedIn. So just look up small business M&A, look up online business acquisitions, type in things like how to buy a boring business, you'll, you'll find what you want. Um, now, Cody, we've got a winner of an incredible Yay. prize. So um, first of all, I don't, don't know if you could quickly first describe this prize. So they get, a, they get your mastermind, right? Yeah, so you get, uh, what you guys get, oh, I can actually show it to you here. You guys get access to, um, this is the very first course I ever created and the one that we uh, update on a quarterly basis. And it talks you through everything about how to buy businesses and how to get cash flow. And so, you know, this comes with a community of people that are all engaged on it. And I think an opportunity for you to pick which asset class you want to invest in. And so I think a lot of people on here from what, this is the right product for you. Like you shouldn't join our, our masterminds for people that have like hundreds of thousands they want to allocate and they're going hard. But this product, what this is for is for humans who are like, 
I need my money to make money for me. Do I buy this? Do I buy that? Do I invest in this? Do I invest in that? I don't know. And then you get around a group of people that are all asking that same question. And instead of a bunch of people who would say, you got to do Airbnbs, you got to do stocks. It's like, no, no, no. We're going to find the right answer for Rebecca. And that's what this community does. So I'm, I'm stoked. You'll have to tell me the name and I'll welcome you into the community. Awesome. Well, big congratulations to, and it's now sitting in the chat there. Uh, congratulations to Pallavi Madakasira. I do apology, apologize for my pronunciation. It was probably very wrong, but regardless, uh, congratulations, because you have won and you will be joining Cody's Mastermind. So congratulations. And thank you so much, Cody, for being a part of Her Future today. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to meeting you, Pallavi.